All right, peace and greetings, YouTubers. So I got a chance to watch the documentary Summer of Soul, or at least when a revolution could not be televised. And I have to say, it was a really, really great watch. I suggest you all go and check it out when you get a chance. It's available on Hulu. It was directed by Questlove, and it covers the experience of what took place during the Harlem Cultural Festival of 1969. Now, this was a festival that took place over the span of six weeks, and so every Sunday at 3 p.m., everybody in the area knew to head to the park because the show was gonna start, and of course, they had this lineup of all of these different entertainers that pretty much would entertain the crowd and keep everybody engaged for a few hours. And so, that's what the documentary is about. But overall, there's so much to be taken from what was presented. Everything from the music, the conversations, the context, there's just a richness to it as you watch. As I was watching it, I was like, wow, I'm literally witnessing greatness. And what made it so great is like, again, this is all black music and black talent. And just one of the things I kept thinking about as I was seeing all of these people go on a stage, and we'll talk about the music in a second, but just seeing the fact that most of these entertainers and musicians were not even trained. You know, they learned how to sing, how to perform, how, how to play whatever instrument, just self-taught by ear. Grandma taught them. Dad taught them. There, there was no such thing as, you know, going to whatever fancy school to learn how to play the different instruments or go to this vocal coach and this vocal school to learn how to sing. It was all either taught in church or from some relative or you just learned it on your own. And so it was amazing to see just what it is that raw talent could create. And watching it, I just felt so empowered by the time it ended because it's like, man, we really do come from a lineage of just greatness when you're talking about just blackness in general. And so there's so much to be said about the documentary. It covers a lot of things. In addition to the music, it's also talking about just the context of what was happening in the country at that time, what was happening in black America, what was happening in America, what was happening politically, what was happening economically. So even consciously where people were. So there's so many conversations to be had. But overall, one of my favorite aspects of the documentary was the fact that most of the commentary, if not all of the commentary that you heard, either came from people who were performers or people who were in the audience. Sometimes when they come out with these documentaries, as great as they are, sometimes you get too much commentary from music critics and other people who aren't even there. People who, as great as they are within their field of study or within their scope of work, sometimes you just want to hear from the people who were there to experience it because they can give you a context that's different than somebody who's only reporting on it like myself, okay? And so, you know, watching it and, and when you heard from just even the people who were in the audience, a lot of the people who were featured in this documentary at the time of the festival, they were either kids or very young adults. They were in that stage of life where they're very impressionable and at the same time they get heavily influenced by what it is that's presented to them, but they also have the world at their feet and they don't even realize the greatness that they're standing in because you know they'll appreciate it years down the line, but for them, some of these things were just the norm. It was, it was just normal to see you know great concerts in your neighborhood at the time. And so it was just amazing to hear that context from the people who were there because you know they can paint the picture and make it seem like you're really there. You know, they could tell you what the smells were, what everybody's hair looked like, who was using Murray's and who was using Afro Sheen, you know, what kind of food was out there, what the music sounded like, even just being able to, to retell how the music hit everybody. Because of course, when you hear a song on the radio or, or in your car or even while you're cleaning the house or something, music sounds one way when you play it through a device. But of course, when you're there, there's different things that you always end up remembering. There was a portion in the documentary where they talked about the drums. Um, where you know there were different people playing different drums and congos and bongos and all percussion and everything like that and how it kind of just rattled throughout the crowds that were out there and remember like every night there was like 50,000 people who were out there and so it made me think like even think to your experiences when you go to a concert there's some moments that you always remember especially when it comes to the music and so I was thinking back like I remember I saw Jill Scott one time and I remember her background singers were just it was like a wall of sound that just hit you when they opened their mouths. And so I still remember that. I remember seeing Maxwell in his brass section in 2009. It just, you know, he, he rocked the entire Verizon Center. Well, now it's the Capital One Arena. And for those from way back when in D.C., it was the MCI Center. But that brass section just was like it resonated through the whole arena. And at the time, we were in the 400 section. We were bumping our heads on the roof. But, I mean, the music just hit. Or, you know, even I saw Janet at Madison Square Garden. And I remember she did All Night Don't Stop. And the thumping of the doom. Doom, doom, like a whole place was shaking. So hearing the, the perspective of people who were there, it just always adds so much more. And what made me laugh um, when I was thinking about just the kids that were talking about their experience, because again, this was on a Sunday. So you know a lot of those kids had to go to church first before they could go to the festival. So just imagine, you know, being a 10 or 11 or 13 year old in church 
waiting for the service to end. And of course, that's probably the service when the service got really good. And so it kept getting longer and longer because maybe everybody was shouting or the choir did two or three reprises and a C and a D selection. And then, you know, the sermon was extra long that day and the pastor preached for an hour instead of 25 minutes. And so imagine those kids that were sitting in those pews, those wooden pews, anxious, ready to go because they want to get to the park as soon as they can because they want a good spot because Sly and Family Stone's going to be there that day. Gladys Knight and the Pips are going to be there. David Ruffin is going to be there. And so, you know, so many great aspects or even, again, their perception from the performers and talking about how, you know, they could feel the love of the crowd as they came on the stage or being surprised that they got such great receptions. I mean, there was so much to be said. And when it came to the music, again, such variety, you know, when it comes to black music, black music is so universal and black music taps literally every genre and you pretty much saw a lot of that represented with just the festival. Yes, you saw the R&B, yes, you saw the soul, but you saw jazz, you saw rock, you saw funk, you saw alternative, you saw stuff that was more abstract and so as you were just looking at the, the lineup, you had a little bit of everything, even blues, okay? So again, you had Gladys Knight and the Pips who were there and this is early Gladys, you know, this is, okay, I heard it through the grapevine Gladys, but Gladys and the Pips have not you know, transcended into the space of Midnight Train of Georgia or You're the Best Thing That's Ever Happened to Me or If I Were Your Woman or any of those things. Not even to Daddy Could Swear I Declare Yet. Okay, this is early Gladys when they, she was, and the, she and the crew were still hungry for it. They were still getting there. Even with Stevie Wonder. Stevie Wonder was already big, but we know that Stevie Wonder got even bigger by the time you got to the mid 70s. This is just 1969. Okay, and again, Fifth Dimension, another group that's very kind of, I would say, abstract or a little bit more left field from what would have been expected as far as what people perceive black music to be. Because again, people like to put us in a box and limit what it is that we can do. But hearing Fifth Dimension talk about their experience and just, again, just the variety of sounds that they have and, you know, singing the Dawning of Aquarius and all these different songs, like, Okay, all right, and then you had like the Edwin, Edwin Hawkins singer. So now you have gospel there. And at the time, Oh Happy Day was a really big song. You have the Staple Singers, and there's a great segment. I'm trying not to give too many spoilers and spoil it all. Now it's thundering outside, all right. But um, there's a section in there where you have Mahalia Jackson and Mavis Staples share a mic. That's probably one of the most powerful scenes out of the documentary. That I, I enjoyed every moment of that. Um, again, you had Sly and the Family Stone that was there. B.B. King, David Ruffin, who at that point had just left The Temptations. Um, Sonny Chirac, Max Roach. Speaking of Max Roach, so of course the song Grazing in the Grass is featured. Now what's so interesting is that song is way older than me of course but there's a certain warmness I always feel when I hear that song and I say that because growing up my father was like the smoothest driver like he just was always smooth when he drove. You could be in the most hectic lane on the freeway and everybody around you is acting crazy and he'd just be in his little smooth lane and he always either played a lot of throwback music, funk, 80s or he played smooth jazz and so at the time we still lived in Washington State there was this radio station called 98.9 smooth jazz I don't think it's a station anymore but they used to always play grazing in the grass and so as a kid there's kind of a warmness or a sense of security you feel when you're in the car with your father while he's driving. I don't know if you guys have that same experience, but that's what it felt like for me. Like you get that element of security from your father and nurturing from your mother. And so as soon as that song came on while I was watching, automatically it took me back to like being a kid and just feeling like, okay, as long as I'm with my dad, I'm always gonna be safe. Which is so interesting because like that, that song is from generations before mine. And so, and then what I thought about too was, Correlating that same experience to what was happening during that time, so much was happening in the world around 1969. You know, Martin Luther King had just died the year before. You had all of the uprisings in over 100 cities across America after he had been killed. So much was happening, but at the same time, look at the music that was coming out, you know? And so I just kept thinking about that. Um, Nina Simone, man, there's a scene in there with Nina Simone. I, I was cracking up. I was like, oh, I see why this never got released because Nina's out here shaking the table. She just said, are y'all ready? All right, you got to watch to see what it is she's talking about, but I, I loved every minute of it. But I didn't even name everybody. There's, there were so many other musicians that were also featured in artists, but there was just this long roster of talent, so much talent, so much richness. And like I said, such a variety of what it is that was being presented. It wasn't too much of the same thing. And so it just shows that black music has so many layers and elements. And it's just, there's an essence that comes with it. And so one of the other things that was really good about the documentary is they did a great job of putting everything into context of what was happening in the world at that time. And so of course you have Vietnam. We just talked about King being killed and a lot of our other leaders being assassinated or arrested or you know, so you had Malcolm X get killed some years earlier, Medgar Evers, everything happening with the civil rights movement and that transitioning into the black nationalist movement. And then even, they even had the Black Panthers as security. 
you know, um, for the event and just talking about what's happening, conversations around economics, education, poverty, even gentrification projects that took place after the uprisings when certain cities had burned. You know, you had a lot of developers come in there, not with the intent to, to rebuild or recreate or restructure what was there, but to bring in something totally unrelated to the neighborhoods that once is, once existed. And you saw a lot of federally funded programs that pretty much bulldoze some neighborhoods to create different, you know, projects, freeways, so on and so forth. You saw a continuation of that. And so lots of conversations of what was happening at that time. And the part that made me laugh was even a conversation about the moon landing. Literally during one of the weeks of the festival, we landed on the moon. But at the same time, when you're looking at the conversation from, from two different ends of the spectrum, cool, y'all landed on the moon, great, great symbolism. Okay, we beat Russia or something, amen, yeah, go America. But at the same time, on the other end, it's like, okay, y'all spent all of these billions to land on the moon, but you have all of these, you know, these inequities when it comes to housing, jobs, education. There was a heroin epidemic at the time. There was so many things happening across the United States and also within black America. And so it's like, do y'all really expect black America to be excited because people landed on the moon? That's cool. And it made me think back to the, remember the song Whitey on the Moon? It made me think to that as well. And so there's just so much that kind of came out of this documentary. And what makes it so amazing is that there could have been so much more that could have been featured, but they give you just enough. Um, I was reading the backstory on everything in relation to how this finally came out. You know, this whole entire festival was recorded and they had tried to ship and, and shop this documentary or not the documentary, but at least the footage around to be turned into something. And, you know, Hollywood kept saying no. They're like, oh, no, no, nah, we're good. And this is because, again, when it comes to, I guess, conversations around blackness and a lot of times when it comes to creative projects, sometimes they like to put, again, black people in a bubble and say, well, black audiences are they only want one thing at a time. And so. This is the era of when you start getting the black exploitation films. And so a lot of execs felt that, oh, nobody wants to see anything about a festival. No, we got to make it spicy. You know, people want to hear about Cleopatra and Foxy Brown and Operation Get Christy Love. And what else was out there? Um, what's the what's that? What's the one? It's not Blackula. I forgot. Abby Blackula. I think it was Abby Blackula. No, Abby Blackula. Three the hard way. Coffee. You know, Shaft. They want to get all those nice and spicy. That's what we want. You know. And so for some reason, everybody kept passing on it. Maybe because they kept trying to market it as the Black Woodstock, which I think everything we don't always have to make things a black equivalent to something else sometimes we have our own thing i don't consider that a black woodstock i consider that a festival that had a bunch of black artists and it was just that great woodstock cool for them but we don't always have to compare things it's kind of like when people say something like howard is the, the black harvard no howard is howard the same way spellman is spellman or fisk is fisk or tuskegee is tuskegee like you know what i mean anyway but it was a really great watch i suggest you check it out I, again i love the music it was amazing just seeing a lot of the artists because like I said, so many of them were hungry for it. So seeing, you know, a lot of the artists while they were still very young and still up and coming was amazing. I've seen some of these artists live in concert. Like I've seen Stevie before, I've seen Gladys, but I've seen them as seasoned entertainers after they've already conquered the industry, after they've already conquered the world, after they've already been labeled as some of the greatest and, you know, inspirations for a lot of people that will come afterwards. So to see them while they're still on the climb, it was amazing. So it was a really great watch. I suggest you check it out. It's on Hulu. Again, it is called Sounds of the Summer or Sounds of Summer or at least When the Revolution Could Not Be Televised. Anyway, share your two cents. Also, if you were somebody who was fortunate enough to be there or remember that festival specifically, share your experience in the comments section. You know, a lot of us share lots of experiences when it comes to a lot of the different festivals, whether it be something like Essence or something in the water or Broccoli City Fest or whatever festivals exist. It's kind of cool how things can evolve over time and we all share similar experiences, but just in different eras and different times. And so it's always great to kind of hear a collective thought of where everybody was and how people perceive things that take place. So anyway, share your two cents. I'm out.